Today, it's a nice providential day. The church is celebrating a special feast on this Sunday, because of the way the calendar falls, the Feast of the Holy Archangels. The time of the Archangels, the Feast of the Archangels, is always kind of a, a, a time to engage in wonder. It's a good time of the year, being the fall. Fall, I don't know, has a magic to it, as the trees, the leaves change and they fall, and there's just a spirit in the air, you know. And so it's a time where we wonder about things. We wonder about life beyond us as we see the trees losing their life, so to speak, and then knowing that their life will come again on the other side of winter. It's a time where the child within us is reawakened a little bit, because we know when we see these signs, what do we know is coming? You know what's coming. <laughs> Christmas! <laughs> and the church celebrates that. Next Sunday we begin the Nativity Fast, or the Advent, the coming of the Lord. It's a time of anticipation, a time of marvel. And so this is perfect that we celebrate these archangels who announced this coming of the Lord, who heralded his nativity. We're remembering them before we begin even our advent. And we wonder at God's meaning and purpose then. The incarnation brings us to think about the creation itself. The wonderful icon of the nativity is very earthy. It's got caves, it's got animals, and sheep, and water, and plants. It's a very earthy image. Because God himself is becoming part of the creation. He is becoming the second Adam, or the new Adam. And Adam's name is Earth. In Hebrew. Throughout the scripture, we see this wonder at the beauty of God's creation. And throughout the Psalms in particular, our opening psalm at Vespers is that wonderful psalm of creation, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul. But also, we have psalms like Psalm 8, which was wonderfully referenced in today's reading from Hebrews. Psalm 8 mentions the angels, it mentions God's good creation, it mentions the earth. This is what Psalm 8 says, it's a short psalm, so I'll, I'll read it to you in, in its entirety. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise because of your enemies that you may silence or destroy the enemy and the avenger. And when I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. What does that mean? How excellent is your name in all of the earth? How is God's name made excellent in all the earth? All the earth reflects His glory. All the earth reveals His goodness and His wisdom. This is the wonder of life. And we in our humanity, we must find our place in that wondrous creation. We must find our position in the dance of life. The beautiful song of God's creation. We are perhaps the melody. We are the part that God uses to tie the whole together. We are created to be His children, to have dominion, to take care of the earth, to be its guardians. We are. His melody. 
So insignificant, though, we seem compared to the heavens, to the massive vault of the heavens, to the multitude of the stars, to the vastness of space. Yet a little lower than the angels we have been made, but we are crowned with glory and honor. And even in the midst of this beauty, even having received glory and honor, there is in this song, this Psalm 8 in particular, nonetheless a hint of something wrong, a discordant note which is struck, something that darkens the song of the Creator. And it comes out very early, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise because of your enemies, that you may destroy the enemy and the avenger. Who are these enemies? Who is this avenger? What is this discordant note that has disrupted the beautiful song of our Creator? If you know your Tolkien and the Silmarillion, the creation story of Middle Earth, he was making his own poetic meditation on this problem. His own poetic meditation on the creation and what went wrong. And so he talks about how God created the world through song, yet there was one of his minions who struck that discordant note. The book of Hebrews remembers this psalm, as I said. It brings it right to the fore because it's talking about the angels and about the Messiah. In Hebrews chapter 1, the apostle lays out very clearly that the Messiah is not one of the angels, or just one of the angels. The Son of God is not an angelic being, but is something greater than that. In chapter 2, which we read from today, he then lays out how is it that that Messiah relates to us. What is our part in that story? What is our relationship even to the angels? In quoting Psalm 8, the Apostle notes out this discrepancy, which has been caused by the discordant note of the enemy. He says, the Psalm says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all, thing, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. If it says you have put all things under him, then all things should be under him. Not just the beasts and the fish and the birds of the air. All things. But what? But now we do not yet see all things put under him. We do not see this glory and honor on mankind. We do not see mankind fulfilling its role and its purpose as the one who has dominion. But rather we find ourselves in a difficult position. We ourselves find ourselves in subjection to the angels. And God did not put his creation to be subject under the angels. Something is amiss. The original intention of the creator has not come to pass, even though this song sings it. And if the word of the angels proves steadfast, if we should not neglect so great a salvation that God has accomplished, how is it then that this discord and this discrepancy continues? How is it that we are ourselves under subjection still? What do we see? The apostle answers, but we see Jesus, who has been made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, did you get that? Is that clear? That's hard stuff, actually. Let's unpack it. In Jesus, we see, again, a second Adam. We see a new humanity, our humanity. Jesus is the Son of God, but he becomes 
the Son of Man. The divine word, who ever existed and always has been. The divine word by whom all creation was made, for whom all things exist, has become a piece of the creation, has become one of us. He who made the angels to be his ministers, to be a fiery flame, has become lower than the angels for us. He who set his glory above the heavens now finally crowns our humanity with honor and glory. But how? How does he do this? He does it through the cross. By suffering of death and tasting death for everyone. He has remembered man and he has visited him and took care of him by taking humanity upon himself. By becoming the son of man. Later in Hebrews chapter 2, such an important chapter, we also read this. Inasmuch then as the children, that's you and me, inasmuch as we have partaken of flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he did not take on the nature of angels, but he did take on him the seed of Abraham. The devil, who had the power of death, who had no ability to create of his own, but only to destroy. He is that enemy. He is that avenger of which the Psalms speak. And not an avenger like the good guys in the Marvel universe. But in this marvelous universe, a very unholy element. He was envious of God, and he was envious of God's love for his children, for mankind. The angels have a glory of their own, and among them the devil had a great and awesome glory, the greatest glory beyond God's, next to God's. But it, for him, it was not good enough. In his jealousy, he fell like lightning from heaven, and so became the enemy of God, seeking vengeance against his creator and against the creation of which he was jealous. He put man, therefore, under subjection to him through the power of death, through the fear of death, the deception of sin, and bondage to the grave itself. And ever since then, the beautiful song of God's creation has suffered this discord. See then how different is the character of God from his enemy. How different is the character of God's only begotten Son. He who had an ever greater glory than the devil, whose glory was above the heavens itself, a glory beyond all glory, was willing to become less than he was. Was willing to become less than than even the angels, which means he was willing to become less than the devil, so that he could lead many sons to glory. Who are the sons? Us. And he was not ashamed or jealous of his own glory somehow. He was not ashamed to call us his brethren, even though he was the one who set us free, made us holy again. Hebrews Chapter 2, starting at 11. For be both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, who share the same nature. For which reason Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praises to you. This verse, by the way, we, we, we say this immediately after a child is baptized and finished with the baptism service, we do the churching. That's the first thing I say, in the midst of thine assembly will I sing thy praises, because this child has now become a brother of the Lord. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, here am I and the children whom God has given me, from Isaiah chapter 8. This love to be shared and poured out upon us, is God's good nature and goodwill. 
It is the nature of the grace which is described in Ephesians chapter 2, which we also heard today. We heard, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace we have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ <coughs> Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The nature of the devil is to separate, to divide and conquer, to exalt himself and to humiliate others. The nature of God, on the other hand, who already has an uncontestable dominion, who has a glory which cannot be diminished. His nature is to humble himself so that he could raise us up to share his life and his glory with us so generously so that he could call us his children and, in fact, his brethren. God, brothers and sisters, is not a problem that you have to solve. God is not your problem. God is your solution. The devil, death and sin, this was the problem that he came to solve for us through his incarnation, through his teaching, through his life, through his death and through his resurrection. This is the way he has destroyed his enemy, the devil. This is the way he has overcome the problem of death. He has destroyed the avenger, giving life to the world. Through his suffering, through his self-emptying leadership, captain of our salvation, our humanity is brought to perfection, and our original purpose is now fulfilled in him, and made possible for us to fulfill through him and in him. Because even so, we can still sing that eighth psalm with that note of discord, because we still live in a world that still suffers death. We still live in a world where man is subject to bondage. But now, the difference is, there is a way up. There is a solution presented to us. There is a salvation available to us. This is what Christ has done for us. And so our purpose will be fulfilled. Our destiny will be made truly manifest in him. Thus the Lord can truly say to his apostles when they came back to him rejoicing, Lord, even the devil, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You see, they saw the change. They saw that the universe was changing its rules. No longer was man a victim of the devil and death and sin. All of a sudden, now man was going out into the world, and in the name of Christ, he was defeating those powers. He was changing the rules by which the universe has been operating for so long. And they marveled, and they were filled with wonder. So Christ said to them, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather... Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice for the reason they are subject to you. Because your names have been written in heaven. Do we not see? Do we not yet understand? He whose name is excellent in all the earth desires that our names, earth that they are, be now written large in excellence in heaven. Now our names are written in glory. He has made this so. How has he done it? His pen is the cross. His ink is the blood. And his parchment is your heart and your flesh and your life. That is where he writes this new creation. This is where he Hence, his masterpiece song of the new age to come. Brothers and sisters, pull off the covers. 
Let God in your heart. Let him write his masterpiece into you and you into his masterpiece. And give glory, honor, and worship to him. To the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.